Good morning, and I want to, before I do anything else, invite you right now to be a part of today's services, not just online. If you're able to, if your health allows you to, and there is no greater concern that you have to stay at home, please plan to be with us in just one hour. The choir has been working very hard. This is, as you know, a most unusual year, and they have been working diligently before services, after services, to prepare for this morning's Music, special music today. Uh, the cantata starts at 1030 and we want you to be a part of it. Now, you prepare, you can listen to Sunday School right now as you're getting ready. If you're not yet ready and it takes you a little while to get here, if you um, need to watch this later, start now, stop it. It's the, the beauty of it. We, we know the drawbacks of not being in person, but if you are planning to be a part of our services, please do so this morning. We trust that you've invited some folks. A reminder that uh, we'll have a guest with us tonight. Ed Hoagland is our missionary in Mexico. He'll be in our 6 o'clock service tonight. Another great reason to be back. Has done a great work there in the capital city. Our, our, we were able to be with him in 1994. At that time, we had two very little ones. In fact, one was very, very little. Justin was just a baby. And uh, probably, let's see, probably not even nine months old. And uh, we were able to visit. He stayed home, and we went to visit the Hoaglands in Mexico. Come tonight and hear from Brother Ed in our 6 o'clock service, then reminding you that the 24th, our Christmas Eve service, will be a candlelight, ser candlelight service at 5 o'clock. We want you to hear that and know. Be inviting some folks to be a part of these services, and we're looking forward to it. I am not going to spend a lot of time this morning in preliminaries. I just want to invite your attention to the book of Luke. Chapter number one, very familiar text. In fact, last Sunday morning in the first of our Christmas series, we talked about this uh, uh, similar passage about uh, the Lord's promise in Isaiah 7.14 to send through a virgin a son named Emmanuel. And here is the fulfillment of it that we talked about. We want to talk about what Mary experienced and her response. Because again, as we talked about Sunday morning, the people involved give us a wonderful glimpse of who God chooses. And as we've learned many times over, it is not always those that we would choose writing the story out. It is not always those that we would say are the stronger or the mighty, as the scripture talks about it, or those who have influence or prestige, those who have sway over society or an influence in culture. No. God uses sometimes the most obscure individuals, the most obscure places, to accomplish his purposes because then the power and the might and the glory that is demonstrated has to be from him. Mary and God's selection of her is one of those illustrations of that very premise. In chapter 1, we're going to begin today in verse number 26 and see what God does in the announcement and then the follow-through to select Mary and to see it come to fruition that God brings about his plan using this young woman. Well, the first thing we noticed is found in verse 26 and a few verses that follow it, and it's the greeting because the news is not just... Uh, discovered by Mary. She doesn't live it out and moment by no moment begin to put pieces together. No, in fact, as often is the case, God selects a messenger to come and deliver that message to Mary. And the greeting is what we find in verses 26 through 29. Let me just read that and we'll jump right into the text. We're in Luke chapter 1. Start with me at verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when, they, when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. Well, the first thing we see here is this is the sixth month. This refers to what we've looked at already was Elizabeth's pregnancy. Uh, she is with child according to the prophecy given to Zacharias, her husband. And she is pregnant with the child who will become John the Baptist. In that sixth month, the Bible says that the, the angel Gabriel, uh, who's already appeared earlier in, the, in this, this letter to, from Theophilus here, who writes 
this book, if we read the very beginning verses of it as Luke writes it, he's writing it to Theophilus and he's telling the story. Gabriel has already appeared. He is sent from God. This is not the imaginations of Mary. This is not the fabrications of man. This is a message delivered from God to her. Um, One of the interesting things is that when we read this, uh, in the city of Galilee named Nazareth, I mentioned a moment ago that God delights to choose the people who are not necessarily the ones we would pick. I think Theophilus might be a little surprised when he hears from Luke that God chose a woman here who is uh, in Galilee, is specifically in the city of Nazareth. Um, Luke identifies it here. This is a region in the north of Israel. It's bordered on one side by the Sea of Galilee, on the west side by the Mediterranean Sea, on the north by what we would consider or or call today Lebanon and Syria. Uh, On the south, it's bordered by Samaria. Nazareth is not a town that prominent people come from. In fact, people didn't want to live there. A few years later, uh, Nathaniel, one of the men who meets the Lord Jesus in the early days of his ministry in John chapter 1 says, can any good thing come from Nazareth? And it's a popular phrase at that time. Please notice this. God chooses an, what we consider a, a le, not lesser known necessarily, but not well known or well regarded, we should say, place like Nazareth for the selection of Mary. We just had a little power outage here. God chooses the out of the way places like Nazareth for his son to be born. And again, it is this magnification of the work of God. It draws attention to the power of God when it's not found in the location or in the individual. He goes on to to do uh, this introduction. Luke identifies both Joseph and Mary. He talks about Mary being a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. A reminder for us, if you haven't watched last Sunday morning's sermon, Isaiah 7.14, God delivers through the prophet Isaiah the prophecy. This is the sign. That was for King Ahaz. This is your sign. A virgin shall conceive. And God says, here comes an angel to deliver to a virgin who is betrothed to a man. Now that uh, word betrothed there is the concept. It's much different relationship than we have in modern engagements. Uh, Today's engagements run the course of someone Um, getting down on one knee with his ring in hand and proposing marriage. And from that time until the day that they're officially married, they are engaged. They're planning that stage of marriage. Um, A couple here goes through a wedding ceremony and they're considered married, except they didn't live together. They didn't have marital relations for one year. This was the ceremony taking place, and they're betrothed. And then one year later, there was a second confirmation of that marriage. They went on to live as a normal couple, and they normalized the the habits of a married couple. The condition here explains why Matthew, in his gospel, says Joseph would have to divorce Mary. He'd have to put her away because the thought was that she was unfaithful. That was the evidence that they were given. And so there was something more binding than a contemporary engagement. So we see that she's betrothed, and then we're identify, we see identified Joseph uh, of the house of David. Now, what's the point of bringing that up? I mentioned in that sermon last Sunday that Joseph himself was not someone of means or wealth or position or power, and yet here we have his lineage, his heritage of the house of David. Now, the reality is there were many who were of that house. Not everyone was of that tribe even, but he was. Now, is that to call attention to his prestige or his place in life? No. In fact, this is to remind us that he is of the proper lineage. The prophecy mandated that the Messiah would come from David's heirs. We've already seen Luke's uh, we've already seen the, the the gospel writer who tells us Mary is of that lineage. And now De- uh, Joseph, who we know is going to be, as we would call it, the stepfather of Jesus, he is of that lineage. And then Luke goes on to say that her name was Mary. In verses 28 and 29, we read that the angel comes in and um, 
unlike what we saw earlier where the angel Gabriel goes to Zacharias in the temple and his ministry talks to the would-be father at that time, now the angel goes directly to Mary. And I think part of that is, and you probably will agree, that the impact of this, the weight of what is going to happen, who would believe the word of another? Who would believe the testimony of a young woman who is betrothed in marriage? Who would believe her story? I, I got to ask the question, would you believe it yourself? If she was living this out, would you be able to grasp fully what is going on without the explanation, a divine messenger explaining it to you? And so she has this an angelic visitation so that she understands fully the divine nature of what's going to happen. This is not a physical anomaly. This is a divine intervention. God is doing his work, and he's doing it in you. And so the angel comes and says, Hail thou that art highly favored. I see this in the same classification that I see Gideon out there in the wine press um, threshing wheat. And the angel then comes, the messenger comes and says, To him something of his mighty man of valor. Here thou that art highly favored. Uh, I think the thought there is she's favored simply because God's chosen her. She's favored because you have an angel visiting you to tell you what is about to come. That in and of itself is the favoring uh, of God. But then notice as well, the Lord is with thee. I got to tell you, that little phrase, tucked here and elsewhere, is such a, a, a reassurance to us. There are times in our life when we're faced with difficulties, and you've been there just like I have, and we wonder, is God still with me? Well, here's the truth from Scripture. He has promised to never leave us or forsake us. But there need to be these moments where that reassurance comes in and the angel brings it here. The Lord is with you. It, it does more than describe just God's presence. It emphasizes what we've already read, the favor of God, the grace of God that is upon you for what will come next. Mary's position, her status here, indicates how God is blessing her by choosing her to bear the Messiah. Why is she highly favored? Well, we could go back and argue about her life or her consistency or her faithfulness, and we could do that, but we would do it kind of as a, a, in an absence of what the Scripture tells us. What do we know here? She is favored, and the Lord is with her because He has selected her to accomplish His purposes. She is the one who is going to carry the child, the Messiah, until birth. Mary, then, we find, has what we would consider a rather familiar, expected response. The Bible says in verse 29, when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. I always chuckle a little bit there, and you've heard me preach it before and say, that there's your understatement. When the angel of God, when Gabriel comes to you privately and personally and delivers to you the message from God, this would be all of our response. At the very least, she is troubled at his saying, and she casts it in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. What, what is he saying? She is trying to grapple with the troubling circumstance that she's faced with here. Uh, this is the, the stress of mind, of body. I believe her heart rate is probably elevated. Her blood pressure goes up physiologically. Her mind is scrambling around to try to re resolve, reconcile, absorb all of the things that she's heard. And then she's trying to cast it in her mind. She is trying to discern what's happening here. She's trying to sort it out. What have I heard? I wonder if you've ever been in a circumstance where you heard something and it was difficult to believe and you tried to resolve it. I have a, a number of illustrations that I won't necessarily share where someone has called or someone has told me of some shocking news and my mind said, I don't think that's what I just heard trying to resolve it and sort it out. That's what Mary is doing here. Why is Gabriel here? What, is that really Gabriel? And yes, it is. Then what does he want with me? Trying to cast this in her mind. What was the manner of the salutation? What is it exactly that he's saying to me? Well, after he greets her, he's going to clarify that in verses 30 and following. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. I think one of the things here is, Mary, I've got the right place. I know who you are. I'm here on purpose. It's not a mistake. It's not a coincidence. You are Mary. I am Gabriel, and I have a message for you from God. 
And so he, he goes on to say, You found favor with God. Verse 31, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. And again, the prophecy of Isaiah 14, that message, that sign to King Ahaz, here is the sign delivered, fulfilled. He shall be great and he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. That's a lot to process right there. Not only that you're going to be with child, not only that you are going to deliver a son, but here is his name, and here's who he is. God is going to do this. Mary truly had found favor with God um, in order to be a part of this, I believe that is evidence of the favor that God has shown to her. I think one of the things we want to learn, if we can take a moment to make application right now, is this favor with God. Again, undeserved, we would say unmerited, and yet favor from God. It is a reminder for us that grace is in abundance. Grace describes this uh, good will of God without any merit, God has favored her. It's good for us to remind ourselves that grace, God's grace, cannot be earned. None of us have salvation by our own works or by good things. Salvation comes by the grace of God. So too does the choosing of God to use us, found in the grace of God. Be grateful. Rejoice in the call of God in your life. Rejoice in the direction of God to serve Him and the privilege it is. And then be reminded that it is the grace of God and not our own good that has warranted this. The greeting goes on to, to, to describe here the conception, bearing a son. You're going to name him Jesus. Now, there is something here about that in Jewish society. A, a, a child, as he is named or she is named, honors usually someone in the family. You find a lot of um, bar someone, meaning the, the son of or the brother of. There's someone in the family that is being recognized. A, an angel is later going to inform um, Joseph that his name is going to be Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. It's important to know. His name was a testament to his purpose in being here. And at this point, the angel begins to describe what could only be attributed to Messiah. I believe Mary starts to recognize this. And again, there's an angel in her presence. He is delivering this message. He's named her by name. But the, the, the message that he delivers at this point rings so messianic for anyone who was a Hebrew, who had heard Scripture, studied Scripture, been taught by others. These things are not the normal for a child. They're not the blessings. Uh, may your child grow strong and may he be... Uh, 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 useful in life, and may he bring children. It was none of those things. This had a bigger picture. These descriptions were eternal. Look at what the, the angel says. He shall be great. Well, we hope that they all would be. Shall be called the son of the highest. We're in a whole different league right now. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. I believe that one phrase alone, for Mary, who was of the right lineage, would be a spark. His father David, all of the generations looking forward to Messiah, knew, and those who were of that tribe and of that lineage could say, our father is David. Now, they all could say that in generalities, but those who were of the tribe and the lineage and the line of David knew it could come through our family. It will come through our larger family, but it could be my parents or my brother or sister. It could be me. And Mary understands this when she hears it at least in part. Again, she's casting these things in her mind. She's trying to discern what is being said. He's great. He's the son of the Most High. He's, the, he's going to receive the throne of his father, David. And then he talks about uh, giving unto him the, the throne of his father, David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. It's specifically related to the nation of Israel, but Messiah is going to reign far broader than that. And in our study of Isaiah, We've seen this already. God is going to come, the Lord Jesus, and reign over all the nations. But here specifically, Mary understands he is going to reign over his people Israel. The statement is a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7. That's that wonderful counselor. It talks about the government that will be upon his shoulders. It will talk about his reign and his kingdom. 
uh, a, the, the, the reign here, to, to have the throne of David and to reign that way, means that Messiah's dominion is going to be broad. It's going to be immense, and his kingdom would be eternal. It means it has no end. How is this different? Well, every king has a rise and a fall. That's what we study in the history books. This, came, this king came, he did this, he reigned for this many years, and then he fell one way or the other. And that uh, sounds very similar to the Old Testament, doesn't it? When we talk about that. Now, Mary has an understanding. This job that I am being called to do, this task that is being presented to me, this privilege to serve, is huge. This does not just have the ramifications that she's going to think of initially. What? Me? Joseph? My parents? My family? My community? My people? This is much larger than that. He is going to reign eternally. And this, prop- this uh, proposition, as we'll say, it was really more of a direction from the angel, in verse 34, is met with a question. And we talked about in a, a week ago uh, Zacharias's question. But look at hers. Mary then Mary said to the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? She was absorbing all of this as she put it in her mind. I'm going to have a child, it's going to be a son, and this is what God's going to do with my son. But she says there's one problem. I've never been intimate with a man. Not even Joseph, my betrothed. Asking a question is not the same as questioning. Think about that for a moment. Asking a question doesn't mean that you have to question the overall picture. Zechariah, we we saw a week ago, had questioned God when Gabriel told him about the call and the child that would be born there. Um, He was an experienced priest. He should have understood the power of God and the miraculous nature of God and what God was able to deliver. And when the prophecy of, uh, of John the Baptist's birth was fulfilled, Zechariah paid the price of doubt by being made dumb. He was silent for those months that uh, John the Baptist, before John the Baptist was born. Here, however, it's a contrast with what Mary says. She hears this amazing news. The breadth of what she has heard is immense. And instead, she says a question of a different nature. The angel rebukes Zechariah for his doubt, and here he responds to Mary, as if it's a question of innocence. What does she say? How shall this be? How are you going to do this? And again, writing loses some of the tone of its speaking it. We take the context of it to understand it. But what is she questioning? This is how a young woman conceives all the time, every time. How are you going to accomplish this? Well, by the way, that question was not a problem for the angel. He knew that God was already working. Um, the answer is is uh, told in terms without the specific details. And I talked with someone after last Sunday morning sermon about this. How does God accomplish this? Could God have accomplished it a different way? Absolutely. But what he says, the angel says in verse 35, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee, thee is, shall be called the Son of God. The Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you. Pastor Matt, what are the intricate details of how this takes place? I don't know. And Mary wasn't told. But it's a broader sense. Now, I want you to think about this. The Holy Spirit we find in the book of Genesis is present at the the beginning of creation. He functions in the lives of believers. Um, And so this is not unusual that this is the way that God uh, is dealing with mankind. The, the person of the Holy Spirit working firsthand in this is not necessarily a surprise. The power of the, of the highest, it says there, shall overshadow thee. What are we talking about? This is the supernatural work of God. The power of the Almighty, the power of the Most High, the power of the highest. It doesn't surprise us that he's able to do this. Why did he do it this way? Because he chose to. God created the universe out of his own spoken word. He can do what he wills with creation. And then the, the Bible say that the Holy, Sp- the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost accomplishes this, um, and the child is the Son of God. This child would be holy. 
set apart in a way even more so than any others who have been considered set apart. This is, in fact, the Son of God. Verse 36 goes on to illustrate this work. Behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath conceived a son, also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. What is happening here? Mary is trying to absorb this, and she says, how how is this going to happen? This, humanly speaking, seems impossible. And the angel says, psst. If you see Elizabeth, the next time you see her, she is six months pregnant. And that, in Mary's mind, is a miracle. Wait, she's older. She's barren. No one believes she's going to be pregnant. And the angel says she already is. In fact, she's six months along. That, that is evidence here, a, a, a stamp of approval. In her old age, she conceived a son. You, you, you believe what you've heard today because of what has already taken place. And then, then the, uh, the response here, the point for Mary was that God has already done a miracle, uh, a, a strong work in the life of Elizabeth, your cousin, and God is going to accomplish his purpose through you. I want to assure you today that when you're facing life and you're facing the difficulty and the struggles and the questions that you have, this may seem insurmountable to you and me. It does. I have people come and present their situations. We talk about it. And in my heart, my humanly speaking, I say, that is huge. How in the world is that ever going to be resolved? And yet we serve and worship a God who does immense things, impossible things. I love the fact that the timing of God, this linear chronology here that God has put into place, is a stamp of approval for Mary to say, I'm struggling or I will struggle to believe, but all I have to do is look at my cousin. Because I would have never believed that took place. And God was able to do that. His purpose is going to be accomplished and he's going to demonstrate it in a strong way. We tend to consider um, potential in terms of how the the known laws of nature work. We talked about this last week with regard to the virgin birth. Mary is recognizing the power of God has no limits. And Jesus would say later to his disciples, what is impossible for you really only seems impossible because with God it's not impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. And I want you to know that God does it this way because he talks in these terms about his redemptive work. Why is this necessary? Why is Mary going to be with child? Why is there going to be a birth? Why is he going to be the son of God? For this purpose, God is working out his plan of redemption so that his own son, God in the flesh, would come and die on a cross with a sinless life so that he could be the payment for our lives, for our sin. Listen, that's why he came. God is doing the work of redemption. And then I want you to notice, finally, this morning, the, the response that Mary has. This is wonderful, isn't it? I, I, I got to do a little hand motions here. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. What a commitment. Listen, this is the lesson for us. When God speaks, how will we respond? When God gives the direction, where will we go? When we read the scripture and it speaks to our hearts and we understand it and it challenges us, what will we do with it? The first step to commitment is to recognize who we are in relationship to God. Mary knew her role and she trusted the Lord. Let me ask you a question today. Do you think that Mary, at that point, at verse 37, verse 38, fully understood everything that was going to happen? I don't believe she could. I believe even if she understood everything that was said, she really couldn't comprehend it until it started to play out. And by the way, there was more detail that would be played out in her pregnancy and the birth. Bethlehem, she knows nothing of Bethlehem. She knows nothing of an escape to Egypt. She knows nothing of those things. And yet she says in this verse, I am your handmaid. I am your servant and may it be to me whatever you want to accomplish. Listen, that's the challenge for us. God, I don't know all the pieces and parts. The things I do see are daunting. The things I see and imagine are impossible. But God, I am going to trust you. Let it be according to me as your word is. I, I, I love the phrase that she, she gives in verse 38, be it unto me. 
If, if we walked with every day of our life being that commitment, God, be it unto me. Let that happen to me today. This is an embrace of not only the will of God, but of God himself. And I believe those two things are very difficult to separate. I believe it is, it is difficult, if not impossible, for us to say, I love God, but I have no interest in doing what he wants for me. I trust God, but I really don't want to obey. Those go hand in hand. So Mary, like her believers, we are to submit with humility to God and to his purposes. He desires to do so much, to accomplish so much, and He desires to use us if we'll simply trust Him. The, the hymn that was my dad's favorite, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. It's such a simple little song. It really should be a children's song, I think. But the meaning and the, the application of it is difficult. Mary says, Be it unto me according to your word. What should we say? And when we pick up the Bible and we read in our personal devotions, when we listen to a sermon that speaks to our hearts and we hear verses that have meaning and application, God, may that be to me just exactly what you have for me. May your will be worked out in me. What does it mean? I've got to submit my will to him. I've got to make my calendar fit his. I've got to make my desires and my goals match his. My will has to take second place. In fact, what really should be said is my will becomes his will. In fact, the other way around, God's will becomes my will. And we understand it to be a submission and an obedience. And it really is, in fact, an embracing of God himself. What does Mary know at that point? She knows only what the angel told her, but the beautiful thing is she follows through. May we be people who follow through when we've accepted the will of God. Tackle it. with Embrace it. With a, with a vision and a focus that lines up our life with what God's will is. God may not be working out the plan of redemption in ways like he did with Mary in our lives, but I believe God uses us and desires to use us to reach other people with the gospel. Don't you believe that? And in some way, that's the plan of redemption, that they hear the gospel and respond. May we be willing vessels, servants of God, just like Mary. Father, help us to put this into practice in a way this week, even today, of willingness, humility, obedience to the will of God. May we put self aside in favor of what you have for us and simply trust and simply obey. Thank you for Mary's example. Thank you for how you worked your plan out using simple people. May we simply be used as well. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. You've got just under a half hour to be a part of the cantata this morning. I look forward to seeing you. God bless you.